Good morning and welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. I'm your host, Tom Fress, and I'll be with you for the next hour. And we're on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. As many of you are aware now, we've begun a new book here on Inquisition Update entitled Rome and Civil Liberty by James A. Wiley. And I particularly chose this book because it's a, it's a, it's a very, very poignant follow-on to the previous book that we read here on Inquisition Update, The Global Vatican, by a former U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. We are exploring history to find out if what Francis Rooney described in his book has happened in history before. And we can use that history to determine and to confirm what Francis Rooney proposes in his book that the Vatican controls American foreign and domestic policy. That the Vatican is, has essentially overthrown our government, has essentially destroyed our Constitution, and is destroying our civil liberties in order to destroy Protestantism in this country. That's what that book reveals. And it has happened once before in history. Oh, not once before. But in England, it certainly did. And other nations, even France, and we'll talk about that in future books here on Inquisition Update, as we have in the past. But we're concentrating on page Roman numeral 5. It's the introduction to the book, the preface of the book. And we concluded with the reading of the first and second paragraphs of this introductory uh, preface. And what, our, what James A. Wiley has told us is that the Roman Catholic Church is immutable. I mean, it is going to exist until Christ returns. It is the Church of Antichrist. After all, James A. Wiley wrote the book, The Papacy is the Antichrist. He was absolutely correct. He understands that the Church of Rome is the Church of Antichrist, and it is immutable. It cannot be reformed. It cannot be changed. It is what it is and will remain what it is until Christ returns, and it is on this earth to try the saints of Almighty God to try us as if by fire. And just as Satan never relents in his war against the throne of Almighty God, the Church of Rome never relents in its war against the kingdom of heaven. Now, he mentions in the second paragraph a, an immortal work by authors Barrow, Chillingsworth, and Stillingsfleet, and that it was an exhaustive refutation of the Roman Catholic Church, its doctrines, its teachings, its anti-biblical traditions, proving that it is not a Christian church. It is the counterfeit church of Christ. It is the synagogue of Satan. It is diametrically opposed to the Bible and to Christ. That work is magnificent in its refutation of the Roman Catholic Church. But that work does not tell us how the war strategy of the Roman Catholic Church against the true body of Christ in this world changes from time to time. Her war strategy changes. Remember, the Council of Trent, as established by the Roman Catholic Church, which was led by the Jesuit order, pronounced a war of annihilation against Protestantism. That's what the Council of Trent was. It's called the Counter-Reformation. The Council of Trent is the Counter-Reformation. It began right after, within 40 years of the Protestant Reformation in 1517. In 1565, Rome had launched the Jesuits and had set a course to annihilate Protestantism. 
Protestantism threatened the very foundation of the Church of Antichrist, and Rome had to retaliate, and it has been retaliating ever since the Council of Trent. England was a Protestant nation, and it was the focus of the Counter-Reformation. Rome concentrated most of her efforts to destroy Protestantism in Great Britain. If it could topple Protestantism in Great Britain, it might well topple Protestantism as it had spread all throughout Europe and even the colonial, colonial USA. So Rome, so so England at this time is the very focus of the pro, of the uh, Counter Reformation, and James A. Wiley is warning his nation. It seems that at the time of the writing of this book, England as many times as she had been attacked by the Vatican through the gunpowder plot to destroy Protestant Great Brit or Protestant Parliament, the gunpowder plot, the Spanish Armada to overthrow the Protestant crown, the Babington plot, many, many, uh, and not to mention three civil wars, the papacy immersed England into three civil wars where the Roman Catholics rose up in opposition against uh, the government in order to impose Roman Catholicism as the state religion. No nation on earth has had to fight more diligently to preserve Protestantism and Protestant liberties than Great Britain. And this work by Barrow, Chillingsworth, and Stillingfleet exhaustively refuted the errors of the Roman Catholic Church, proving that it is not a Christian church, but they didn't even touch on the subject of the Counter-Reformation. How does Rome wage her war against the body of Christ, against Protestantism? That's what this book addresses. James A. Wiley is going to warn the British people, the British Parliament, and the British Crown, and the world, just precisely how the Vatican was attempting to overthrow the legitimate Protestant government and the Protestant Constitution of Great Britain and all of its Protestant liberties, and throw them back into the dark days of tyranny, as it existed all over Europe prior to the Protestant Reformation. Now, he calls this attack against Protestantism and against the crown of England as a papal aggression. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, he begins in, in, in uh, paragraph 3 of the introduction of the preface of this book. He says, the papal aggression is here viewed as a whole from its rise to what may be regarded as well nigh its completion. So, he's telling us that Rome has advanced in her counter-reformation strategy in Great Britain to such, a, such an extent that it had almost been completed in 1865. He says the author, that is James A. Wiley, has been solicitous, in other words, very diligent, to extricate or to draw out for our examination the fundamental principle of that aggression, the Counter-Reformation, and clearly to explain its implied logic. Where is Rome taking this country? He has shown the successive stages by which it has been advanced. The successive stages of the Counter-Reformation and how it has advanced in Great Britain and the goal to which it inevitably, st it, it, it inevitably tends. That is the overthrow of the British crown, the overthrow of the coronation oath that demands that the queen be Protestant and that she even must in her oath denounce 
transubstantiation, this so-called power of the Roman Catholic priest to change the bread of communion into the blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ, the whole Christ, in order to sacrifice it over and over and over again on the altar. That is not the Protestant belief. That is the Roman Catholic belief, and the, and the monarch of England had to swear against transubstantiation and the power of the Roman Catholic priests. These false doctrines, these false beliefs and practices of the Roman Catholic Church, proving that it is the Church of Antichrist. The monarch of England had to be Protestant, not just in word, but in deed. Okay? Rome had to overthrow that Protestant constitution, the Protestant government, the Protestant crown, the Protestant oath. It had to destroy Protestantism in Great Britain. That was its full intent. That was the stated effort of the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation at the Council of Trent. Now, the author has, moreover, supported and illustrated his arguments by the great facts which form the past dozen years' history of Europe. Okay? James A. Wiley isn't just going to make wild assertions. He isn't just going to raise unfounded suspicion and fears. He's going to prove his assertions. No one's going to be able to argue with James A. Wiley when he gets done making the case against Rome and her attempt to overthrow the British government. This is no, this is no light work. This is facts on the ground in England in 1865. Verifiable facts on the ground. And he says the author... James A. Wiley does not conceal his opinion that the civil liberty of the country, are you losing your civil liberty here in the United States of America? Well, England was losing their civil rights in England in 1865. He says, the author does not conceal his opinion that the civil liberty of the country as, is at this hour in very great peril in more immediate peril perhaps than its religious liberty for it is the policy of rome the policy of the vatican the policy of the papacy the policy of the counter-reformation council of trent to strike at the religious liberty of a country through the sides of the civil liberties of the country that's what James A. Wiley says, that destroying the civil liberties of Great Britain was a means used by the Counter-Reformation to overthrow the religious liberty of the country. That's exactly what is happening in this country today. We know by example after example after example after example throughout all history wherever Rome rises to an equality with Protestantism it makes inroads into the government to change the laws to take away the civil liberties of the people and then with that power of legislation with that control of the government, even to the point of destroying the civil liberties of a nation, it then uses that advantage to make the country Catholic, to overthrow Rome's enemies. And the, the most lethal enemy, Rome admits, is Protestantism. It's happening in the United States today, just as it happened in England in 1865 not so long ago and when you comprehend what James A. Wiley is thinking what he is saying the proofs that he supports his arguments you've got to wonder how the United States could be so blind as to what's going on in this country 
This is a magnificent work. I hope you listen carefully. I hope you call your friends and family to listen to this program, to read this book by uh, yourself. And you'll find a link to this book on my website, inquisitionupdate.org, thanks to Nicholas, and uh, apparently put, put forth some work on my website. And you can go and click on the link, and you can read this book for yourself right along with me. You can ask me questions via email, and uh, we're going to come to an understanding here at Inquisition Update about what's really going on in this country, because it's happened before. Almost a mirror image of what took place in England in 1865 is taking place in the United States of America. Our civil liberties are being destroyed so as to change the country to be Roman Catholic. Rome has championed civil liberty ever since the Revolutionary War. The Maryland colony preached religious liberty and toleration. But now that Rome has, reach, has reached parity with Protestants, and having effectively destroyed Protestantism in this country via Vatican Council II and the ecumenical movement, Rome has clear sailing from here on out to take over the government, to destroy our civil liberties, and to enslave us to the Pope of Rome. Can you imagine, at the time of the writing of this book, can you even, can you even imagine, during the time of the writing of this book, the British Parliament inviting the Pope of Rome to come to speak to its legislators? No way! But the United States did. <clears throat> the legislature of the United States invited. No, they didn't accept his offer to come. They invited the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible to come and speak to our legislature. And there was no protest. No protest. It's unthinkable. If James A. Wiley could see what was going on in this country, he would turn in his grave. He says, the civil liberties of the country at this hour are in very great per peril. In more immediate peril, perhaps, than its religious liberty. For it is the policy of the Antichrist of Rome to strike at the latter, that is, to strike at religious liberty through the sides of the civil government. Using the civil government, once it is taken over by the papacy, to use that civil government to attack the religious liberty of the country. Yes, it has happened before. And we are going to learn a lesson that will never be forgot when we read this book, if we understand it, in our context, in the context of our generation. Now, he says the papal aggression in the author's judgment was a violation of the Constitution of England, of the kingdom, as settled at the Revolution. Yes, Rome had her own revolution. We know, we think we know all about the Revolutionary War of the United States, but there was a revolution in England. They overthrew the papal power. Just as all of Europe overthrew the papal power and, in, and installed their own government and their own constitution, no longer did the Pope dictate the laws of the land and by those laws make everyone, whether they wanted to be or not, conform to Roman Catholic canon law, to actually be Roman Catholic. Great Britain overthrew the papal power overthrew its papal government, put themselves a new government fashioned to protect, to preserve Protestant liberty, and even made the queen swear to be Protestant. 
And that's exactly what the United States is suffering today, the papal aggression to take over to take over the Constitution and to make this kingdom, make this United States Roman Catholic. And it's going to take a revolution to overthrow it. If not a physical armed revolution, it's going to take a spiritual war. We must be armed with the Bible. We must be armed with history to positively identify amidst all the confusion, amidst all the false the false information that we receive from the mainstream media and every other form of media in this country. It's not the Muslims that are taking over this country. It's Rome. You know, we're, we've been indoctrinated for so long. Oh, if we let the Muslims in here, we're going to be under Sharia law. The Muslims are going to constitute a nation within a nation. They're going to have their own laws. They're going to have their own legislature. They're going to have their own caliphate. And they're our enemies. They're our sworn enemies. They're going to kill us if they ever rise to parity in this country. We can't allow Muslims to come in this country and have their own form of justice. We'd be committing national suicide if we allowed the Muslims to come to this country and do what they fully intend to do. But what we fail to realize is we've had the equivalent of the Muslims in this country ever since the Revolutionary War. Roman Catholic canon law is not one whit different than Sharia law. Do you comprehend that? Rome has steadily bided her time and put out decoys and other boogeymen so that we won't even pay any attention to her anymore. And not only have we don't fear Rome anymore, we've ecumenically reunited with the Roman Catholic Church post-Vatican Council too. We've already surrendered to the enemy. Why dare we worry about the Muslims? And Sharia law, when we've already made bacon with the whore of Rome. We must open our eyes in this country, and this book is going to help to do it. And if it doesn't, I don't know what will. He says the papal aggression in James A. Wiley's judgment was a violation of the constitution of the kingdom as settled at the revolution. And to the extent to which that aggression has been carried... To the same extent has the throne been betrayed and the rights of the subjects invaded. Okay? To the extent that the papal aggression has overthrown the Constitution, has overthrown the British crown, to every extent it has betrayed the rights and liberties of the people. He says his charge is not that our statesmen, our parliamentarians in the British Parliament have tolerated the religion of the Pope. Look, they're Protestants. We're tolerant. Look, we know, Protestants know from the Bible that it's God who calls and it's God who chooses it's God who works in the hearts and the minds of men and converts them to his dear son. We don't go about being intolerant of other religions. It is our hope and prayer that if when we spread the gospel that it will find fertile soil in these people of other religions and they will convert to Christ or Christ will convert them to himself. That's not how Rome works. That's not how Rome works. But England is being forever patient with the papists in their country, hoping eventually that the gospel will find fertile soil, that Christ will convert them to the truth, and they will leave the Roman Catholic Church and willfully of their own will support a Protestant nation. We'll be back right after this. 
Okay, welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to, to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio. And if you wish to contact me with questions, comments, suggestions, criticism. Yeah, I'll even tolerate criticism if you don't go too far. <laughs> you may contact me personally by email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. Tom at S-E-A-W-A-V-E-S dot U-S. Now, James A. Wiley is not charging, is not accusing the Parliament of Great Britain of tolerating the religion of the Pope. No, they truly believe in religious liberty. This is the domain of Christ. It's he who seeks that which was lost. It's he who adds to his kingdom. It's he who calls and he who chooses. So it's not his accusation that the Parliament has tolerated the religion of the Pope, but that they have sanctioned the authority of the Pope. Not that they have permitted the spread of another faith, but that they have per permitted the erection of another government. He is accusing the British Parliament that by through the laws that they have passed, laws that protect Roman Catholics, they have in effect overthrown the authority of the crown in favor of installing the papacy as a new government. Remember the papacy claims to be the vicar of Christ. To be king of kings and lord of lords. And his efforts throughout all history prove consistently that the papacy regards himself as the monarch of monarchs. No monarch has a right to rule in this world unless he is approved by the Pope and is obedient to the Pope. <clears throat> and when the British Parliament, in the name of religious liberty, began to pass laws that favored Roman Catholics in the land, he, they, they did not realize that they were literally making the Pope the King of England. Simple as that. And he's going to show us in detail in this work just exactly what his charge is and then to justify that charge to Parliament. And we might make the same charge to our Parliament, to our Congress, and to our White House. The same thing that's happening in Great Britain at this time has happened already in the United States of America. James A. Wiley is, is screaming his lungs out, trying to make sense to the British people and Parliament and the Crown. And that's why I'm so hoarse after eight years of screaming the same warnings here on First Amendment Radio. He continues now, he says, of all earthly possessions, liberty is the most precious. It is bought at a greater price and preserved with greater watchfulness than any other. Tyranny comes with muffled foot. In other words, tyranny comes silently. It steals upon us like the night. It deposits, while a nation sleeps, the seeds of arbitrary rule. Not constitutional rule, not the rule of God, but the rule of a single man, arbitrary. Not based on God's law, not based on the natural law, but based on Roman Catholic canon law. And Roman Catholic canon law says the Pope may dispense with any law whenever it's, whenever it is, uh, what's the word I want to use? Convenient. Okay, that's arbitrary law. Now, we know God's law never changes. Not one jot or one tittle should be removed from the law. 
but the papal law changes. Okay, that's the difference between Christ and Antichrist. We have another difference. Christ never violated even one tenet of one jot or one tittle of the law. Had he violated any law of God, he would have been unfit to redeem us. He was perfect, without spot or blemish. In other words, he obeyed to the letter God's law. The Antichrist, however, is exempt even from his own laws and may break them at will. That's arbitrary rule. He says, tyranny comes with a muffled foot. It steals upon us like the night. It deposits while the nation sleeps the seeds of arbitrary rule. That's Roman Catholic canon law. That's papal rule that he's talking about. And under pretense of redressing wrong or advancing liberty, it strikes a fatal blow at justice and freedom. Okay? Rome comes preaching justice. Rome comes preaching freedom. But what you get is lawlessness, because that's what you would expect from the man of sin, wouldn't you? Lawlessness and injustice. That's what the papacy is begging to accomplish in Britain at this time to overthrow the legitimate Protestant government, the Protestant liberties, and to return to papal tyranny, to eject the liberty of Christ, to eject Christ and all of his liberty, and to replace it with the man of sin and tyranny. Now he says a somewhat jealous mood is at all times one of the best bulwarks of a nation's liberty. What did he just say? You know, we here in America are confused by the meanings of, of certain words, and here is an example of that. Envy is a sin. Envy says that I want what my brother has. What is lawfully my brother's, I want for myself. I envy my neighbor. And envy, if gone to its full extent, is theft. Because that envy becomes greed. And then one's conscience is seared with a hot iron and then he is free to take what belongs to his brother. It's a violation of the law, thou shalt not steal. Inherent in the law of God is private property. Envy is always a sin. But jealousy, on the other hand, is something entirely different. Our God describes himself as a jealous God. I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. He's jealous of us. He bought us with a price, the blood of his own son. He made us his spouse. He loves us with a jealous love. And just as if some other man made an advance to my wife, I have a righteous jealousy for her protection. It's holy. To be jealous of one's own things is righteous. Okay? Now, we have a perfect ownership of liberty in this country. It was bought for us by Christ. And we should protect our liberties with the same jealousy that we would protect our beloved wife. There is no sin in jealousy. Or God is a sinner. And who could call it sin of a God who has a jealous love for us? 
jealousy is not a sin. Now he says, of all earthly possessions, that's ownership, right? Liberty is the most precious. It is bought at a greater price. We own it. It's ours, rightfully ours. And it is preserved with greater watchfulness than any other. Okay? The example of my wife. I preserve her and protect her with a greater, greater watchfulness than any other in my life. Same for my liberties. Okay? It's a prized possession. It belongs to us rightfully. We should be jealous of it and protect it with everything we have. Now it says tyranny, on the other hand, as opposed to liberty, tyranny comes on muffled foot. It steals upon us like the night. It deposits, while the nation sleeps, the seeds of arbitrary rule. Arbitrary rule is not liberty. Arbitrary rule is tyranny, unrighteous tyranny. You know, the God said that our laws should be, our, our justice should be blind, that kings should be treated the same under God's law than street sweepers. God is no respecter of persons. The law is the law. It's applied equally among every member of the body of Christ. Not so in Roman Catholic canon law. It favors the elite. It favors Rome's friends. It lets them off the hook and puts the burden on us. This is why Roman Catholicism, this is why Roman Catholic canon law was eagerly done away with after the Protestant Reformation. The people were oppressed. Every day was unrighteousness. There was no justice in the land. It was tyranny from the Pope and tyranny from the king of the nation who did the Pope's bidding. It was the very same way in England before the glorious revolution. It was fresh in the memories of these Brits. It was fresh in the memory of James A. Wiley. It should be fresh in the minds of Americans today, but it's not. Completely lost. It deposits while a nation sleeps the seeds of arbitrary rule and under the pretense of redressing wrong, in other words, doing righteousness, or of advancing liberty. You know, the, Pope, every, the, the whole world thinks the Pope is the Prince of Peace, as we discovered in the, the global Vatican by Francis Rooney. He's the arbiter of all the peace in the world. While in fact, he foments all the wars. Okay? It operates under the pretense of redressing wrong or of advancing liberty. It strikes a fatal blow at justice and freedom. That's what popery is. That's what the Church of Antichrist is. That's what the man of sin is. He's the man of sin. Not justice and righteousness or liberty, but tyranny, unrighteousness, and antichrist. Nobody knew this better than James A. Wiley at the time of the writing of this book. England was familiar with the history of the papacy suffered mightily the persecutions of, and trials and tribulations of Rome. How in the world could England have forgotten? And I ask the same question of Americans today. He says, a somewhat jealous mood is at all times one of the best bulwarks of a nation's liberties. But at the present hour, when the causes of alarm are so imminent, we can scarce be too watchful against apathy, lethargy, an uncaring attitude, 
in regard to the public interests or too alert to repel the inroads of the tyranny of all others, the stealthiest and the basest. What has James A. Wiley used just to describe the tyranny of the papacy? It's the stealthiest and the basest encroachment you can imagine. Okay? That's why Protestants must be ever vigilant to protect their Protestant liberties. Because Rome changes her strategies constantly. She never changes her dogma. She never changes her, her counter-reformation goal. She changes her war strategy. She changes her war of attack. She changes the color of her uniform. She changes her appearance. But she never changes in her desire, her aim, her diabolical determination to destroy the kingdom of Christ and anything Protestant. And he says, the Protestantism of Britain, we are told, is sound, safe and sound, and will bestir itself. In other words, it will wake up when this crisis comes. Now listen carefully what James A. Wiley says now. He says, the crisis is now. What will come is the catastrophe. Can you hear the, the urgency in James A. Wiley's voice? The time for the overthrow of our Protestant government and all of our liberties, the effect of the Protestant Reformation is about to be overthrown the, on the very brink of being overthrown by the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. And it is Parliament, our own government, that is making it possible. Does anybody see anything familiar in this? What is the catastrophe that is imminent? The overthrow of the government the Protestant government, the biblical government of Great Britain. The Antichrist is ready to throw Christ off of his rightful throne in Great Britain. That's the catastrophe. That's the catastrophe for Great Britain at the time of the writing of this book, and that is the catastrophe that we face every moment of every day in the United States of America. It is at the threshold. And some would argue, and I'm surprised Nicholas hasn't piped in and said, it's already happened, Tom. Now this is, this is why my voice is cracking. This is the most urgent message that can be brought to the people of the United States today. And I can't put a squelch on my fervor it's that serious this isn't melodrama this is desperation we know there's something wrong in the country Obama appears to be a Muslim we know we're on the very threat of losing all of our civil liberties, and yet there isn't a handful of people in this country that realize who the enemy really is. Against whom do we fight? The Muslims? Give me a break. Give me a break. Obama's a papist. I don't care how many times on the television he has professed to be a Muslim. I don't care how many times he says it when push comes to shove, he'll side with the Muslim. It's all an act. It's all an act. Read my lips. It's all an act. He takes his orders from Rome. He was reared in Chicago by Jesuit priests. He's feigning to be Muslim in order to drive the Protestants and the Catholics together against a common enemy. He is doing this to make us believe that the White House has been overthrown by Sharia law. That it's 
that it, Obama is going to bring in these Muslims into this country, while all at the same time, Catholics are flooding into this country by the millions through the through the, the borders with South America, South and Central America. <clears throat> He's no more a Muslim than the man in the moon. He works for the man of sin. Look, if you can't believe that that Obama serves the man of sin, then you don't believe your Bible. It plainly says he reigns over the kings of the earth. No Muslim has ever reigned over the kings of the earth or ever will reign over the kings of the earth. Come on! Do you believe your Bible or not? God's telling us the truth. Are we going to believe him? You know what God said of Abraham? Abraham, our father, our spiritual father, he says, and he believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Do you want righteousness? Do you want to be accounted by God to be righteous? Then believe him. That's all it takes. Believe him. I'll tell you what, if Barack Obama is a Muslim, then I'm a piece of green cheese. Don't you believe it for a moment. It's a perfect war strategy. It's a perfect counter-reformation strategy to make the United States a Christian nation, a so-called Christian nation, an absolutely clueless Christian nation, believe that he's a Muslim. Because that will drive Christians together. Oh, yeah, we still call the pedophile church of Rome a Christian church. The idolatrous church of Rome, the Christian church, the papal church of Rome, a Christian church. We have to unite all Christians. We can't be dividers and try to separate the, 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 the separated brethren once again to their Protestant beliefs. No, we have to unite all of Christianity under the man of sin, the son of perdition, the very one that James A. Wiley is warning Great Britain about. The Antichrist is stealing the nation, overthrowing the government. But in the United States today, oh, we have to unite all Christians against this Muslim invasion. And they're even so successful as to having snuck into the White House. You bought it, hook, line, and sinker. You buy every deception Satan comes up with, every deception the Counter-Reformation puts forward. He's no more Muslim than the man in the moon. He is a papist, or the Bible is a liar. Do you comprehend that? The Bible didn't waste words when it said he reigns over the kings of the earth. Did it sink in? The crisis is now. What will come is the catastrophe. The very catastrophe that James A. Wiley feared for Great Britain at this time is the very catastrophe that is, that is ill on the move right here in the United States of America today. We simply must comprehend what James A. Wiley is telling the Brits at this time and apply it to our own day. He says the author, James A. Wiley, earnestly solicits from every lover of liberty and especially for, from every lover of the gospel a careful consideration of the facts and reasonings presented in the present volume. The cause is preeminently the cause of our country at this hour. And if the cause of Great Britain, the cause of the whole world. Does that make sense to you? Let me put it in my own terms. The cause of Great Britain at that time was the cause of the whole world. James A. Wiley's warning wasn't just to his own country, his own parliament, his own queen, his own Protestant brothers in England. 
It was a warning to the whole world. Now this Antichrist power that he so much feared, the catastrophe that he must oh, so feared, is global now. Not just the fall of the United States, not just the fall of Great Britain, but the whole world. The papacy is going to rule this whole world. That's the new world order. It's simply the reestablishment on a global basis of the old world order that Great Britain threw off. We've got to do it again. We have to do it again. I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>